I removed the momentary switch and swapped in this toggle switch instead, since the momentary switch didn't seem to work as I expected. And I measured the battery draw with the switch on, and it is less than 10 milliamps. Uh, that's the resolution that I had in, on my meter. So it's kind of puzzling to me how you could have an alternator uh, malfunction light work with this particular alternator, but I don't have one of those, I don't want one of those, so I'm just not going to worry about it at this time. With that switch in there, it should work well enough to do additional testing. Now remember this alternator performance curve that came along with the alternator that I purchased from DB Electrical? Well, I don't have a lot of confidence in this curve. And that's because this alternator is sourced from China. And Chinese places have a nasty habit of not giving you what you pay for. So not only do I think that this curve may not be correct, I hope that I'm wrong, but I'm thinking it may not be. But also, let me ask you it this way. So if you were a contract manufacturer and you were instructed to build 10,000 alternators and ship one of these test sheets along with each alternator, what would be the best way to maximize your profits? Well, one way is you could test every single alternator, print out a sheet for that particular alternator, and stuff one in every box. Or you could print out 10,000 identical sheets and just stuff one in every box. There's a good chance that's what happened. But I'm a little bit optimistic because this spec sheet doesn't match the one that was in their advertisement. It's a little bit different. In fact, it's a little bit better. And uh, this voltage of 15 volts, if they're just going to print out the same spec sheet 10,000 times, they wouldn't put 15 in here because that's so high it's almost defective. It should be 14.7 uh, or so. So I'm going to go through, run this engine at uh, various different RPM levels, according to my tachometer down here, and measure the output current of the alternator. Now, this is taken at 13.5 volts. I'm going to be measuring it at some lower voltage, so my curve will likely not be quite as high as theirs. But I'm actually going to be testing out this curve. I've never actually seen somebody do that. Maybe there are videos on YouTube of people testing alternator curves, but I'm going to do it on mine, because I want to know what this thing really does. Now, I went through all of the spec sheets, did all the calculations, and this engine should be matched for this alternator. Uh, in fact, the engine is just a little bit oversized. I wanted to be conservative. If you don't match the two up, you could get into a situation where your engine bogs down and uh, you fall off the bottom end of that alternator curve and it'll just get stuck there. Um, this should not do that, so I should be able to load the alternator fully and the engine should be able to power it. We will find out if I size these correctly or if I made a mistake. Now, in order to test this thing out, I need to have a load of some sort that can draw at least 100 amps. I have it hooked up to this battery, or at least I will connect it, and uh, what do I have that draws 12 volts DC at at least 100 amps? Hmm. I don't know if I've ever done that before. Oh, I know! An inverter! I happen to have one or a dozen of these, so I'm going to use the same type of loader I always use, an inverter and an electric heater. Okay, I've got my inverter hooked up to this electric heater. I'm going to turn that on medium, which is about 100 amps. Connect it to this battery, because alternators always need batteries. And uh, we've got a throttle control over here, so I can adjust the engine speed. Attack, so I can monitor what speed it's adjusted to. And my voltmeter, which will be connected up directly to the alternator, so we know what it's actually outputting at the alternator terminals, and an amp meter to see how many amps the alternator is putting out. And I'm just going to start this thing up, start at low RPMs, and work my way up. Hopefully the setup that I have survives, hopefully the coupling doesn't slip or something, and we'll see if this alternator actually does what it is advertised to do.
first time fire up of my 12 volt generator I learned a few things. One of them was not the output curve of the alternator unfortunately. One of the things that I learned was that I have a connector drawn. I noticed that uh, there's only two terminals here and somehow I managed to connect my switch up to the wrong one. Life is hard but I guess it's even harder when you're stupid. So what I'm actually doing here is switching on and off my reference terminal. Now normally it would default back to the internal reference. This particular alternator apparently doesn't do that, it just shuts off. So I can effectively turn it on and off through this switch. And the, uh, the current that normally serves your ignition light, this is a kind of a one-wire, three-wire hybrid, so it seems to work alright without that switch. I'm just going to leave it connected up how it is. <clears throat> this effectively lets me turn the alternator on and off. A lot of other ones won't work that way, but this one seems to. Another thing I learned is that my platform that I have this mounted on, as I feared, it's not solid enough. The skid plate is too weak, and the engine rots around on the uh, on the uh, the plate that it's mounted to. So I just set it on some more compliant materials, added this jack for some weight, and hopefully it doesn't try to walk itself across the floor. And the final thing I learned is that unfortunately my engine seems to be underpowered for this alternator. I uh, did a fair amount of work trying to match them up, but the alternator is about 10% more output than it was advertised to be, and that just might be pushing me over the edge. So I can't get an output curve, because if I run the engine too slowly, it tends to stall out under full load. So what I'm going to do here instead is try to figure out what engine RPM I need in order to be able to keep everything running, even when the alternator is under full load. And unfortunately, at higher speeds, it generates more amperage, and I'm pretty sure the alternator is going to overheat. So I affixed a thermocouple with some high temperature tape to the alternator, and I'm going to monitor the temperature to see how quickly that rises. Alternators are typically wound with 200C magnet wire, <clears throat> 200 degrees Celsius, but uh, realistically, you don't want to run them more than about 150 degrees Celsius for any length of time. This is a 10SI series alternator. It's not protected in any way from being overheated. The CS130s and CS144s, the replacement to these uh, 10SIs, 12SIs, 27SIs, those are internally protected. If the temperature rises above, I think it's 147 Celsius, something like that, it shuts down and lets it cool off. So basically I'm just going to monitor this and 150C is going to be my threshold. If it gets above that, then I know it's too hot. And you can see that I have the thermocouple tape to this uh, laminated silicon steel core. <clears throat> because that'll be the hot part. The windings go directly through that. This case just holds it all together. And uh, it won't get nearly as warm as this middle part in there. So I'm going to fire it back up and see if I can learn something more. I ran my 12 volt generator setup for about 15 minutes and it ran beautifully. However, it was a complete failure. I'm not the most mechanically inclined person and it seems to show here. The problems that I ran into were, for one, the temperature of this alternator on this thermocouple attached with this high temperature tape. It showed that it reached 150 degrees Celsius after 10 or 15 minutes and it seemed to hold that temperature at about 150 degrees Celsius at around 60 amps output. So this particular alternator, this 10SI high output alternator, cannot withstand more than about 60 amps continuous. And that's interesting because GM designed this 10SI to do up to 63 amps. And I'm sure that number is not by accident. It was engineered and 63 amps is what it was engineered for. Since then, aftermarket people have been trying to increase the power in this same case, and they have apparently failed to do so. So I need to have something a little bit heavier, apparently, if I want to do this, or limit my output to around 60 amps. The second thing that I ran into was that the spider in here is completely destroyed. I don't know if you can see that, but uh, it started firing out shredded pieces of that rubber spider out at me and uh, yeah it's completely shredded so 
This attachment method did not work out for me. I'm going to have to go back to a belt type setup, unfortunately. What did work out well were these anti-vibration mounts, makeshift anti-vibration mounts that I put in here for temporary use. Those actually worked pretty well. Um, surprisingly, a lot better than I thought they would. But, uh, so I've gone back and I've looked on the internet for ways to connect these properly with pulleys. And I did find a pulley that I think will work for the alternator and also a pulley that I think will work for the engine. And a V-belt also that should should match up pretty well and uh, allow me to couple the two together. I'll have to remove it from this plate, which was not strong enough anyway, and build some sort of probably wood for now uh, platform to put them on. But I've got about a week before those parts arrive in the mail since I live in a rather small town and I can't really buy things locally. So I'll wait for those to arrive and then I will continue. Most sensible people in this situation would probably give up and just buy a generator. And uh, yeah, that probably would be the most sensible thing to do. But I've wanted to do this for around 10 years, build a 12-volt generator, and I'm not going to give up quite that easily. So I am going to continue.